I ran upstairs, uh, saw that Elvis uh, was face down in the rug in the bathroom. Uh, I felt him and I knew that Elvis was not alive. And Elvis was lying on the floor in the bathroom and Joe Esposito, Elvis' uh, road manager, and Al Strada, one of his uh, uh, wardrobe men, were trying to work on Elvis's body and revive him, and I started to help too. And uh, you don't want to notice, but uh, uh, you could see rigor mortis had already set in. He'd been dead since about 10 o'clock that morning. Elvis Presley, he's dead. Wish he wouldn't, but he is. Elvis Presley, dead at 42 and mourned by millions around the world, was laid to rest today in a colorful ceremony in Memphis. It was August 16, 1977, and the world was shocked by the news. Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll, was dead. His wake and funeral drew tens of thousands of fans to his Graceland mansion. Millions worldwide mourned his passing, and yet to this day, there are some who believe the king lives. Those people who say Elvis lives are not referring to his music lasting forever or his spirit being with them. Some of these people really believe that the king is alive. He called and he said, I'm doing fine and I know you've been wondering what I've been doing and everything's okay and thank you for caring. That was basically it. I was sort of in shock so I didn't, he called me at work. He said, do you know who this is? Right. He asked me if I knew who this was. I said, uh, I think so. <laughs> Most of the fans believe there's probably more evidence uh, to believe Elvis is alive than he is dead. G.B. Giorgio is the author of the book, Is Elvis Alive? And she claims to have had personal contact with him after he died, as did the previous woman who was an Elvis fan club official. And, of course, there have been tabloid sightings of Presley as well. Most of those are quite humorous to everyone except those who were closest to Elvis Presley. It makes me uh, furious. Uh, this lady, I don't know, I, this woman was uh, here in town one day out selling her book that Elvis had been seen here and there and yonder. And... Uh, I had been interviewed that morning, and I absolutely got so mad until I went out there. And if she'd have been a man, I'd have whipped her butt is what I'd have done. <laughs> J.D. Sumner, along with Charlie Hodge sitting next to him, toured with Elvis for over a decade. They were good friends. Hodge was at Graceland the day Elvis died. And we tried to revive him all the way to the hospital. And uh, by that time, Dr. Nicopolis, Elvis's physician, had arrived. And we went to the hospital, and then uh, they went in and started, uh, you know, trying to revive him. And then they came out, uh, I guess, about 30 minutes later, and uh, Dr. Nick just shook his head and said he's gone. Another longtime member of Elvis's entourage is Joe Esposito. He was Presley's road manager and one of the first to try to resuscitate the dead singer. Dr. Nick was kept trying to revive him in the in the ambulance, and. Uh, just hoping that we see any sign of life on him, but I just knew there was no sign of life. In spite of the testimony of these men who were all so close to Elvis and who witnessed his death firsthand, there is still an element believing he's alive. Although on a recent trip to Graceland, it was hard to find the non-believers. I think he's definitely dead. There's no doubt in my mind. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. It's a shame that the people say that. Because uh, for me, in uh, the old days, it was my favorite singer. Eh? And it is a complete story. And I uh, don't think the people must say he is alive. For what? It would be great if he was, but he isn't. I don't believe, no. Elvis's family and friends feel that alleged sightings of the king are no mystery. No, it's not that they believe them. It's just they feel they understand what motivates people into making such outlandish accusations. It's the obvious reason, the almighty buck. Well, it's done just to make money. It is the hottest subject there is going now, and as long as they can find anything, anyone can go in, anyone can write a book nowadays, if they'll go in and say, I know Elvis Presley personally, it's all done for selling. And as long as people can make money by writing a book, then they're not actually saying anything bad, they're just they're speculating. 
Money does seem to be the motivation behind most of the reported Elvis sightings. But then again, Elvis Presley is big business. His estate earns more and more money each year. However, to Presley's near and dear, there is a cruelness to all the credence lent to the stories of Elvis still being alive. It's ridiculous. You know, that is ridiculous. It's no joke. You know, I, I wonder if people don't have a heart. What do they think about, what do they think they're doing to Lisa? To this child that saw her father, you know, uh, it's cruel. It is very cruel, you know. It, it's no big joke. These people are sick that has to go around and, you know, start rumors like this. You know, I'd like to issue a challenge to the people that say they've seen him. Well, bring him forth. Where is he? We'll offer money if they've got the, if they've got Elvis somewhere. Prove to me Elvis is alive. Come to me and show me your proof. They don't do that. There is one more thing that has Elvis Presley's closest annoyed, and that is the insinuation that Presley would be the perpetrator of a hoax. According to J.D. Sumner, that just wasn't the King's style. Elvis believed in his fans. He had adored his fans. He admired his fans. And he was not the kind of person to ever tell a lie or live a lie. Elvis didn't have to. If there was ever a truthful man, it was Elvis Presley. This is Graceland, Elvis Presley's mansion. It has become one of the most popular tourist attractions in Memphis. It is where he lived, where he died, and where he is buried. Yes, in spite of what you may have heard or read, or in spite of what some people claim, and as unfortunate as it may be, Elvis Presley is still dead. So you can imagine how excited I am. I'm about to meet the Godfather of Soul. I think I spoke to three or four of his press people, and each one of them told me the exact same thing. They said, you must refer to him as Mr. Brown. Do not call him James. And uh, so, of course, you know, they put the fear of the Lord in you, and, and that's all you're thinking about. That's all you're thinking about is you're about to go meet the Godfather of Soul. Do not call him James Brown. So I'm thinking, as I walk, walk in the room, I've got to call him Mr. Brown. So I walk in, I introduce myself, and I say something like, hello, Mr. Brown, and he says, call me James. <laughs> but before the show even starts, we're actually going to go backstage into the dressing room to talk to the godfather of soul himself. Hello. How are you? It is a pleasure to meet you. How are you? Fine, thank you. Unless Trent from Inside Edition. And the one thing I remember most about him was just, he was so warm and inviting. He, it was almost as though he, uh, he felt like he was a mentor to this, in his eyes, young black reporter. Because <laughs> he, sort of, he sort of spoke to me in that, in that sort of tone where he was just like a fatherly figure giving advice. People say that you look incredibly young, especially out there. I mean, obviously this keeps you young. I thank God and her keep me young. <laughs> we got a beautiful little son, so I think the mixture is great, and thank God for that. But thank you for the compliment. You ever get tired of it? Well, I, I, I get tired if the business don't go correct, you know. Uh, on somebody I really go through it with, it's me and Mr. Bobby over there, my manager. Um, and, uh, we want to do things, and um, you know, we want to do things 25 years ago that just happened today. I mean, you know, people don't move fast, you know, not when it's positive. Right. They move fast when it's negative, you know, but uh, we want to do what we can to keep things straight. And I watch Inside Edition a lot, too, my wife. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, we watch it a lot. It's great, great, and very informative, and very educational, and entertaining, too. And we love you over there. Do you think you'll, do you think you'll ever retire? Yeah, I'll retire when the God put the last breath, put, put the last breath out of me. Now, I may not be jumping across the stage because your legs go, because I'm an athlete and uh, your legs leave. But uh, I won't ever quit because we got projects that, uh, we got some projects that, can't, it's like a, we're over at a gin mill, turning out the different things. We want to turn out complete artists, you know. Just like I took my wife. Your wife I, is an artist now. That's right. <laughs> and, and the thing about, and she answers the name of Tommy Ray. Um, talented people that don't get a complete shot at it, you know, and, and they need that. The Apollo Theater is always the Apollo Theater with me. 
and it's very important to people uh, because it's a matter of opportunity for people that don't think they can make it. Now, I didn't make it through the Apollo, but we need that concept. We had that same thing at Augusta, Georgia, called the Lenox Theater, and that's the way I made it, being shown to the people. So we've got to give our kids a break. You wonder why they find a lot of crime and, and uh, uh, criminal uh, things happening to different people in different areas, uh, because they don't have anything to do. Uh, they don't have anything on their mind. Young people don't have anything on their mind. What, you, what they can have on their mind. You know, you watch the war, you watch all this other stuff. We've got to push entertainment, more sports, and uh, more family discipline. Well, I mean, it's it's an incredible feeling when you think that you, you've you spoken to this icon and then six months later, you know, you're, you're covering stories about his funeral. Um, it was, um, Sometimes in this job, you just you just pinch yourself. You say, "Wow, I, I I can't believe that I that I met this person. I can't believe I was sitting right across from them, and in how how warm and engaging they were." And um, it's just it, it's um you know it's a bittersweet feeling you, you, to to meet somebody who is such an icon and then to lose them so soon afterwards. He really was he was an icon. He was um, he was a civil rights leader. He had a message in his music that was empowering for African Americans back in the 60s and 70s, and it was, it was just incredible. You know what, guys, have a great show tonight. It is a pleasure to meet you, sir. Well, I hope you live 200 years, and I live 200 years minus one day. Yeah. <laughs> so I never know beautiful people like you on an inside edition that passed away. So I'm gonna say, sing a song now you might know. It's called Imagine. You are looking at a lost piece of music history. Imagine there's no heaven. John Lennon's very first live performance of his most beloved song, Imagine. Lennon's widow, Yoko Ono, is sharing this never before seen footage only with Inside Edition. I met with Yoko this week at a New York gallery showing John's artwork. Sherlock Holmes? Sherlock Holmes, I think so. Yeah. No, uh, Sherlock Lennon. Sherlock <laughs> Lennon, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. Yoko has just completed putting together a new CD called Lennon Legend. It's a collection of 20 of Lennon's best solo recordings. Describe for me how his work differs in his solo career from his earlier time when he was with the group. And he's more honest. When the Beatles happened, they probably had some concern too tried to be very commercial and when John got together with me there was that feeling of okay I'm gonna be real you know as a solo artist Lennon's life became his art but Yoko says being so open may have carried too high a price the fact that he was too honest may have uh, uh, may have offended some people may have really uh, <clears throat> Shortening his life, I don't know. You think his lyrics might have in some way I don't encouraged know. I don't Chapman know. to... I offended anybody, you know. But he was um, a very upfront, extremely kind of open mm -hmm. to people. I think that um, sometimes you have to pay a high price for it. And he did it. He just um, gambled on it, I think. In 1970, John recorded what would become his trademark song, Imagine. Life in peace. Soon he was invited to perform it at New York's legendary Apollo Theater. And while introducing the song, Thank John you. was his Thank usual you. witty self. Uh, some of you might wonder what I'm doing here with no drummers and no nothing like that. Well, you might know I lost my old band or I left it. I'm putting a... Backstage, I'm putting Aretha Franklin came and said hello to John. I was just watching Aretha and John just sort of chatting away. I thought, it's great, you know, <laughs> I'm seeing something great. In 1975, John put his solo career on hold to raise his and Yoko's son, Sean. But in 1980 came the comeback album, Double Fantasy. We really felt like we were starting over. And little did we know that it was going to be cut off so quickly. And then the shooting happened. Does it ever make sense? Is um, anything like that ever? No, I mean, it's just a, a, a very sudden thing. It was so sudden, and I think that that was, 
That was very difficult for me. John's beautiful boy, Sean, is now 22. And in May, Sean will follow in his father's footsteps and release his first album. The comparisons will be inevitable. I think so. I'm just watching it and just praying that things are going to be all right for him. And how old will Sean have been at this time? Ah, uh, three. Today, carrying on the Lennon legend is one of Yoko's missions. And she believes John's message has the power to inspire a whole new generation. I think he had a very, very strong spirit. It just gives you a lot of energy. It's there, an inspiration. And the world will live as one. You're a legend, and you haven't stopped. How do you stay current? Hmm. How do you stay, keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening? And I'll tell you this, you know fashion, you know music, you know what's going on. How do you how do you stay involved? I hope that I do have my finger on that. I'm not sure. I hope so. Um, I think you do. I mean, you know, is it are you reading magazines? What, what, how, how does how does Aretha stay um, current and, and keep us excited? Growth. It's the growth element. That's that's what it is. Uh, I certainly don't want to be dated by any means, and it's the growth. I, constant and evolving growth. So when I got the assignment to interview her, I was both excited and nervous. I was excited because it's the great Aretha Franklin. I was nervous because it was the great Aretha Franklin, but it was incredible. It's one of the greatest interviews I've ever done in my career. She has a very down home way about her. And I was telling her that my father's from the South and a bit about my mother and how I grew up in Detroit. And she really appreciated it and connected to that. I think she felt that there was a similarity, though she's much older, a similarity in uh, our values. It was a really, really hot day when I interviewed her. And I had heard uh, stories of how she doesn't like to perform in air conditioning, that she likes the room to be basically hot. And the second I walked into the hotel suite, it was burning up. And, but she looked cool as a cucumber. She was totally relaxed. The most exciting thing musically to me right now is my new album that's coming out uh, in January. It's going to be produced by Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis and a few cuts I'm going to produce myself. Burt Bacharach has some things in it and uh, other writers from Detroit have one or two things in there. But the music, it's just the music that I love so much. And it sounds like from what you're telling me listening to people that it's a real melting pot, it's a cool yes, mix. Yes, it is. You've got a buffet and a plethora of good music. What I really found generous and kind of Aretha is how she complimented Kelly Clarkson, a contestant on American Idol. Aretha thought that she was great. She loved her voice, she loved her performance style, and she basically predicted that she would be a star. Kelly, I think, um, certainly has the potential to be a very enduring uh, and established artist and a favorite. She had a combination of things. Uh, she is a very likable personality and I like that and uh, of course she's a very good singer and uh, the song selection was great and she just kind of impressed me as someone that Broadway might be calling uh, and or a pop recording artist that was the way uh, she impressed me really. If Aretha Franklin who has seen them all says that you're a great singer and you're bound for greatness you can basically take it to the bank. Aretha thought Justin Warini was really charming. She thought he had that special something that makes the young girls swoon. Justin is uh, a crowd pleaser. Um, if I were the age of the little girls, I might have been squealing and screaming myself. But I just thought he was really cute. He had a lot of class and uh, would love for him to open for me sometime. And, um, Does he know that? I don't think so. When Aretha Franklin died, I was uh, heartbroken on two accounts. That 
she is one of the greatest singers ever. So that was sad. But also, Aretha Franklin is Detroit. Her soul is in Detroit. And she's a homegrown girl. And so the city uh, really was devastated by her passing. Aretha Franklin had the opportunity in her career to live anywhere in the world. But she chose to always maintain Detroit as her home. It's because she loved the city. She loved everything about the city. Her father had a church in Detroit. She started singing in the church in Detroit. Her family was in Detroit. She lived there her entire career. And so the love that she gave Detroit, she got back in death. It is exactly why the lines were down the block because people felt like Aretha Franklin was one of them. She was grand, she was glorious, she was bigger than life, but in truth, she was a Detroit girl. Leslie, are you still having fun? Absolutely, if I weren't, I would be sitting at home, cooking, watching the soap operas, and that would be it. Yes, absolutely, I'm having a wonderful time. What a career. What a career. Yes. Uh,